Good afternoon or good evening uh, as it may indeed be and welcome to this Facebook Live again here with me Dave Newton uh, on the Camera World Facebook page. To those of you that have joined me before thank you for coming back. Uh, I can't imagine why but I thank you greatly. Uh, for those of you that are new thank you for joining today. Hopefully you will have lots of questions uh, and you will have uh, lots of um, well, lots of things to learn. I'm going to give you some hints and tips about the Canon EOS R5 and indeed some of them will relate to the R6 as well. We're going to talk about portraits, we'll talk about camera settings, we can actually talk about pretty much anything. The theory is that we talk about portraits and I will indeed start by showing you some portraits both of people and animals. Uh, or, or at least an animal, uh, my, my, my dog Otis. Um, but feel free to answer any questions, uh, or to, sorry, to ask any questions. I'll do the answering, you do the asking. Uh, any questions that you may want to know about with the R5, uh, and I will do my best to, uh, to answer them. So first off, I need to make sure that we're live. It says we're live. Uh, I want to know uh, if anyone is there. Uh, there we go, there's some people there. David Portwain, hello there. Yes, I know we're a week late, unfortunately. Uh, we had some unforeseen circumstances last week uh, that meant that we had to push it by one week. But we're here now, uh, and I am hoping it just means that you're even more eager and excited uh, to find out about, well, I don't really know, to find out about the R5, I guess, to find out about the R5 and some portraits, or indeed to ask questions. Um, because that is the real benefit of a live broadcast, is that you get to ask your questions and get them in live, almost real-time interaction uh, answered. So that's the theory. Uh, obviously, that only really works if you ask the questions. Uh, so there we go. Fabulous. Right. Um, good. There's a few of you there. Um, brilliant. Daryl, hello. Andy, Ian, Andrew, Hazel, Ruth. Um, goodness, loads of you are in there. Brilliant. Fabulous. Okay. So, hands up, those of you. Who, uh, who's managed to get themselves an R5 uh, yet? Who, who's managed to actually uh, secure one of the few that have come through? Uh, I'm going to babble on for a bit while you all comment to say, probably not me, not me, not me. Um, I'm very aware that uh, there are very few R5s coming through. Uh, and there's an awful lot of speculation about why this is. I don't honestly know the real reason. I can hazard a guess at uh, a couple of really good ones, um, but I don't honestly know. All I I would say, um, you know, for all of the all of the rumours that you hear on the internet, everyone loves a good story and a sensational headline. Uh, and uh, you know, basically everyone on the internet now thinks that they write headlines for the Daily Mail. So what I would say, actually, in my opinion, is we had this thing called a pandemic, which is kind of still ongoing, and it shut down some factories, uh, not so much in Japan, but certainly in other areas, and not all components of the cameras are indeed made in Japan. Uh, that kind of affected supply chains, which has probably kind of impacted bits getting to Japan to be assembled into a camera. Uh, and even if you've got stuff that's been made and ready to go out, uh, if it gets stuck, if you get a container load stuck in a port somewhere, uh, then it's going to be, uh, it's going to severely impact supply. Add to that the fact that everybody wants one. Everybody wants one, me included. Uh, I'm, I'm super glad that I still have this one right here. Uh, not to mention the fact that the eagle-eyed among you, oh no, you can't quite see. I'll just do this. Oh look, there's another one over here. Uh, now, this one actually is... Um, uh, this one is uh, a, uh, a pre-production one, so this is basically no better than a paperweight. Uh, but this is a production one, uh, and this is the one that I've been shooting with. So uh, yeah, I'm kind of fortunate to have uh, a couple of them at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky, and I am, I am holding on to this one as long as I possibly can. They keep telling me they need to send it to other places, and I keep coming up with reasons and excuses why they can't take it away from me. I have a horrible feeling it's going to be going at the beginning of next week, though, because uh, I've pretty much used up all of my excuses. So there we go. Um, yes, I would say that uh, that uh, you know it's it's supply chain problems uh, with a pandemic, and also demand has just been phenomenal, uh, and it's kind of like a perfect storm. Anyway, 
So let's crack on, shall we? Because somebody just said, is this portraiture? It is, look at me. Can't you see? I'm looking lovely in a portrait, but this is an M6 Mark II, not an R5 that's beaming this to you. So that's really not gonna help. Anyway, uh, Mo, I think that was. Uh, Mo said, uh, Mo Lee, is this portraiture? It is going to be portraiture. Uh, it's going to be portraiture with the R5. Uh, and now seems like a really good time to, to kind of get started. So I am, as before, going to share my screen. Uh, I am going to show you, I've, I've only really done one portrait shoot, one proper portrait shoot with the R5, uh, and that's what I'm going to show you. We will talk about the autofocus system. Uh, we will talk about flash as well, because, you know, flash is not actually specific to the R5, but flash is uh, a very useful tool, uh, and I will give you some advice on that as well. Uh, and as I said before, ask questions about anything. I don't really care. I mean... Maybe don't ask me political questions, uh, but maybe ask me anything about the R5 or about the Canon system in general, about flash, whatever it is that you want to know. Uh, and I will, um, I will indeed be uh, trying to answer the questions. So let's crack on. Let's uh, let's give you a screen. Here we go. Bingo. Uh, look at this. It looks just like a portrait shoot. Uh, now there's a, there's a whole bundle of pictures in here. Some of them are a little dark where I was setting exposure. Uh, some of them are a little bit light. I was using different kinds of uh, flash modifiers. And the first thing that I'm going to say, uh, here, let me appear in the top corner, and then it's double portraiture, about the R5 is that um, the reality is with portraiture, it's probably not one of the hardest things for a camera to photograph. Good portraits you can do on a lot of different cameras, but there are little subtle things about the R5 that just make it so much better. In fact, there's one really big thing that's possibly not even that subtle about the R5 that makes it fantastic for portraiture and that is the eye focusing. Now I've been a big user of uh, the EOS R since it came out. I've had an EOS R since, since that launch so that's a couple of years now and it's been fantastic for portraiture. For me now uh, I picked up my EOS R the other day uh, alongside the R5 and I suddenly felt like I was a little bit lost with it because the, the controls of the R5 are so natural already uh, that going to the R where I, I lose the position of the AF on button and where I lose uh, the AF point selection button felt a little weird. But really, obviously, the big thing about focusing, uh, about focusing, about the R5 is focusing and about portraiture is focusing. So let's, uh, let's find some pictures. In fact, I'll just, I'll start with this one because uh, I know this, uh, this subject quite liked it. Uh, so these were um, this, these were a series of portraits taken for for this lady. Um, it's kind of like some some LinkedIn and some a bit more fun portraits. Um, just actually, um, while it's going to look you, you well, you saw the collection of them. It, it looks probably like they were taken in a studio. Uh, they actually weren't taken in a studio. They were taken in her back garden uh, because obviously with the pandemic right now uh, with COVID. Uh, I'm trying to stay working outside as much as possible, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm not in, uh, you know, in an, a, an environment with a lot of people. So uh, it seems the most sensible and safe thing to do. So working outside, working on location um, in her back garden, but using lighting to make it look a bit more like a studio shot. Anyway, uh, step number one, uh, I guess, is to have a look at the uh, the focusing capability. So if we come in over here, we can see the uh, see the details. So this was shot. Let me move my, there we go. Uh, this was shot obviously on the R5 at 1600 of a second. That should be the clue that this is outside because there's a lot of ambient light that needs hiding at f2.2. Uh, shot at ISO 100 uh, and um, uh, a 50 mil. So this is using the RF 50 mil f1.2 lens, uh, which is a large but beautiful piece of glass. Um, if you are using the R system, I highly recommend it, um, although I'm aware that it is quite expensive. So let's actually punch in to uh, 100% and we'll see how we get on. So at 2.2, we know that our depth of field is quite shallow. In fact, we can see, uh, let, me, let me zoom in here, uh, we can see that the front eye is sharp and the back eye is soft. That's because it's fallen out of uh, depth of field. And as before, folks, I am indeed showing you uh, raw files. These are totally unedited, uh, so uh, bear that in mind um, when, and you know, this is also 
she's not a model. She's just a, a real person who wanted some portraits doing. Um, so, so bear that in mind. But look how sharp that is on that front eye. Now, when you're shooting wide open, I don't know if you've ever tried it, or shooting fairly close to wide open, with such a shallow depth of field, it's very possible that the focus could hit not the eyeball, which is where you really want it, but it could catch the eyelashes, or maybe the bridge of the nose, um, or the point of the nose, or maybe a bit on the cheek if someone's got slightly sunken eyes. But with the eye tracking AF, it's absolutely nailed the eye, and not just the surround, but the eyeball itself. Uh, and obviously with that 45 megapixels, it's phenomenally sharp as well. So I've just put up here the uh, the AF point that was in use, and, and I was using the eye tracking AF, uh, and the camera has detected the eye, uh, and obviously that's uh, that's been exactly where it's focused. So focusing, um, it, I, I was chatting to someone the other day, a good friend of mine came to visit, uh, and he had a little play with the R5, um, outside we were just standing in the garden taking some pictures and his exact words were this feels like cheating and I kind of had to agree with him because within this set of and I'm not sure how many pictures there are in here there's 340 odd uh, you can see it on the bottom left hand corner um, I don't think it missed focus once I don't think it missed focus on the eye once in fact not at all and that when you're shooting portraits, that's really quite important because obviously we want to focus on the eye, but also someone, you know, someone's expression changes in a microsecond. So if you've got one frame that's in and the next one's out and then the next one's in, the reality of the law of sod is that the one in the middle is going to be the best expression and that's the one that's going to be out of focus. Uh, so when you can take a, a, a bundle of images and expect to get basically all of them sharp, you know, at least 99% of them sharp, that gives you a lot more confidence in what you're doing. Now, as I say, it's not the hardest thing for a camera to do, but being able to shoot wide open, if you've got a lens like an RF 51.2 or even an EF 50mm 1.8 uh, or 51.4, or in fact an EF 51.2 or uh, an 85, any of those fast primes, wide aperture primes, you can shoot with them wide open and be confident in the fact that you're going to get your images sharp every single time or as near as damn it every single time uh, let us oh let's get rid of that there we go um, let's let's start to try this one here um, now once again this one's uh maybe a little harder it's, she's slightly smaller in the frame uh, here let's give you 100 percent again we obviously need to wait for my computer which is actually pretty quick uh, but we need to wait for it to uh to catch up there we go uh, and once again we have got razor sharp focus on the eye so I think it's picked this one she's actually quite uh, quite a lot squarer on in her face in this one uh, which is why we focused on this one but this eye is the one that's slightly out of focus because she this eye is just ever so slightly turned back um, but once again absolutely nailed it now this is not just about focus right this is also about skin tone and uh, white balance and picture styles and all of that kind of jazz and I uh, you know everyone has their own particular view as to what skin tone should look like um, I I know that I quite like my skin tones to be slightly warm Canon give you a variety of picture styles in fact now's a really good time for me to jump in and for those of you that don't know what picture styles are if I come into the edit image window here um, I'm going to show you them over on the side now if you're in DPP you get the ability to change all of these afterwards. Um, but you can also set them at the point of shooting. Now, interestingly, this is set to, to landscape, but I think I may have made an adjustment or two to it. But what we've got is auto standard portrait, landscape, fine detail, neutral faithful monochrome. Uh, and you can pick and choose between them and they will affect the look of your picture. Now, normally, uh, landscape could give, a, it can be a bit too punchy and warm, uh, in this case, it's actually done okay, but that's because of the white balance setting, uh, which I've managed to keep some slightly cooler tones in there. But to give you an idea, let me switch this to portrait and we'll see what happens. You can see how the colours change slightly uh, and it's become a little bit pinker. Now, if you're not looking on a colour calibrated monitor, you might not see that too much or it might suddenly look very weird. Uh, that will depend on your monitor. 
I find it a bit hard looking on my monitor right now because I've got two very bright lights shining in my face, one either side. Uh, so my view of the screen is a little bit odd, but to me, uh, it does look, uh, it, well, it looks a little too pink. So as a general tip for portraits with Canon cameras, portrait picture style is nice. But personally, I tend to find portrait picture style can be a little bit too pink. And the reason for that is you have to remember that Canon are a Japanese company. And if you think about how the Japanese like their skin tones to look, they like to be quite porcelainy and kind of pinky whitey, uh, and very smooth. That's sort of where portrait picture style goes. It's not entirely, but it's moving in that direction, which is why as good as portrait picture style can be, I'm not a big fan of it. I don't use it that often. Uh, I don't know about you. Feel free to hit up the comments. Tell me if you ever use portrait picture style. In fact, tell me if you ever use. Uh, tell me if you uh, ever use the picture styles. I can almost guarantee that most people will not use the picture styles. I've just noticed uh, David. Was it David? Said it's not sharp on the screen now. Uh, that is quite probably just where it takes a while for the files to load in. As I said, they are 45 megapixels, as, as I'm sure we're all aware. Uh, and despite the fact that I'm on a high-spec 16-inch MacBook Pro, uh, they still take a little while to decode. You may see eagle-eyed among you down in the bottom right-hand corner down here. Uh, when I load up a new image, uh, you might see that there's like a little spinning... Um, uh, uh, you might see a little spinning wheel which is loading. David, quick question come in. When you change it in DPP, does it stay when exported to uh, Photoshop? So if, uh, if I make a change in um, DPP, I make some adjustments here. This is raw file adjustments. If I save the raw file, which you should do whenever you quit because it's a non-destructive workflow, so you can always go back to where you were. Uh, when you quit that folder or you quit DPP, uh, it will ask you if you want to save. You say yes. If you open that raw file in um, uh, in Photoshop, it will open it in Adobe Camera Raw and it will not make any of the adjustments. It won't read any of the adjustments that you've made in DPP. If, however, you make your adjustments in DPP and you export to a TIFF or a JPEG, then all of those adjustments get baked in, uh, in which case, yes, Photoshop, when it opens them, will have, well, it should look, assuming your color settings are matched up, it should look uh, exactly as it did uh, when you were looking at it in, in DPP as well. Okay, there we go. Uh, so that was that question. Proof, everybody, uh, that uh, that questions get answered. Chris, you never use picture styles with RAW. Um, why not? Is it simply because you know you can change them afterwards? Uh, and follow-up question, what do you edit your RAW files in? Uh, I will, let's see if I'm psychic, I'm going to say you use Lightroom. I'm going to take a guess and say you use Lightroom because it's pretty much the most popular one. I might be wrong. Maybe it's Camera Raw. We'll find out. John, let us know. Uh, it was John. No, Chris. Chris, let us know what you edit your RAW files in. Um, a benefit of RAW files, uh, the reason I love RAW files, and again, this is not R5 specific, but this is Canon camera generic specific, uh, is that it matches up. If you use portrait picture style on an R5 and on an R6 and on an R and on a 5D Mark IV and a 5D SR and a 80D and a 250D, they will all have the same colour look to them because they're all matched in terms of their colour performance based on the camera that you're using them on. So if you have multiple cameras, it's a really good way of ensuring that the colours all match. Equally, it stops you having the experience, and this is what really moved me to DPP a, a long time ago now. Uh, I kept taking pictures, I'd look at them on the back of the camera and I'd go, hey, that looks pretty good, yeah, I'm quite happy with that, and then I'd load it up onto the computer, I'd open it in, um, it may have been Lightroom, or it may have been in uh, Apple's Aperture, which is uh, now defunct, uh, and suddenly it would look entirely different. Um, it would look flat and dull. Basically, they will have taken the... Uh, the picture style information and thrown it away, binned it entirely. Uh, and so suddenly you get a flat, dull looking picture. Now obviously, yes, you can edit the file to get back to where you were. You can do all your editing to make it look as you did. But if you quite liked the look of it at the point of shooting, to me, I would rather spend more time with the camera in my hands and less time moving a mouse 
or a, or a, a tablet pen around making adjustments. Um, so that's one really good reason to use picture styles. It means that when you, uh, when you take a picture, you look at it on the back of the camera, you open it in DPP, it matches. It looks like it did at the point of taking the picture. Uh, did, anyone, uh, did anyone respond? Uh, did you? Chris, you didn't respond yet. There we go. Um, okay, right. Wow, there's quite a few of you come in. Oh, Chris, here we go. You've just responded. Picture styles I find only benefit JPEG uh, shooters. I use Lightroom. Uh, and major edits in PS. Okay, uh, I can understand that if you're a Lightroom shoot, uh, Lightroom editor, uh, because it does, as I say, it will bin whatever picture style you've you've used. Uh, in which case, you get to spend a lot of time uh, doing uh, doing your editing in Lightroom, and 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 if that works for you, then there is absolutely no reason to change. Okay, uh, right there we go. Uh, where are we now? Uh, let's come back out of here uh, and. You'll notice that most of these all look pretty much, uh, pretty much the same in terms of their lighting, uh, and that's because I'm a big fan of flash, speed light flash, and the great thing about the R5 and R6 is that they use the flash system in exactly the same way as most previous Canon cameras. I'm not going to say all, because there were way back in the annals of time some ones that worked differently. I say back in the annals of time, some, some kind of pre-20D. Uh, but ever since the 20D, they've all worked in much the same way. And flash gives you control. Um, if I was to show you the settings here, in fact, just as an example, this was the first image I took just to see. Oh, no, it wasn't. Uh, yeah, oh, it probably was actually within the yeah of the day. Right. So this is the first image. There's no flash in this picture. Um, but the background looks how I want the background to look. Uh, it's got that dark feel to it. But obviously my subject... Um, is uh, she's dark, she's unlit. Uh, and as I said at the start, that's because this is, I'm shooting outside in her back garden, although it looks like a studio. So I've set my exposure in this case to make sure that the white of her top is not overexposed and the background has the look that I, I want. It's slightly darker, which means when I put some flash on her, it's going, or she's going to stand out against a slightly darker background. It's not going to compete, but it's going to enhance uh, the colour of her hair because they're kind of a nice match. They're not too uh, too punchy or, or contrasty in terms of their colours. So I've set my exposure. Uh, we can see that I've got the shadow highlight alerts turned on. Uh, some of the shadows uh, around here are very dark, but there's nothing overexposed in the highlights. Uh, and at this point, I then need to add in some flash. Now, I use uh, Canon Speedlights, the Speedlight 600 EX RT. Uh, and I use the ST3RT, uh, which gives me radio control, uh, radio transmission. So I can hide flash guns if I want to. I can put them in. Um, I can put them in, in in remote places or put them in soft boxes. I can control them in bright sunlight up to about 30 meters away, uh, and they give me complete control from the camera. Now, one of the things that I may uh, I may try and show you if I can grab my. I'm just looking to see where it may be which bag it's going to be in. There's about six bags of stuff here and I think I know where it is. Good. So I'm going to grab a, a flash transmitter and I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of flash control. But first I wanted to just show you the pictures and explain why. So here is ambient light only, this one, uh, which is highlighted here. Uh, and then we put some flash in. Uh, you can actually see here there's a bit of a shadow of a diffuser which is helping take light off her because the other problem obviously when you're uh, working outside is that if you've got too much ambient light on your subject, they're going to squint like this, kind of like I'm doing because I've put a light in my face, because that's just the way I roll. Um, and uh, it's taken the light down from there and given me a nice, it's underexposed, but soft light on her, which I can then supplement, replace, uh, enhance with, with flash. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to disappear off screen for a second, but I'm going to keep talking to you, because uh, otherwise it's just going to focus on my wall and I'm going to reach in a bag. You're going to hear some Velcro going uh, and uh, here we go. I have grabbed, if I can show you this, da -da, this is an ST3RT. Right, let's come back here because we'll, uh, we'll get to that in just a little bit. So the way Canon Flash works, for those of you that, uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm just checking to make sure there are no more questions. No, all good. Crikey, bundle of you have jumped in. Hello there, all of you, Michael and Ian and Lol. 
uh, Tim and David and Tracy and Ronnie and wow, well, welcome, welcome to this stream. Uh, so the way Flash works uh, and the reason I think Flash is so useful for portraiture is because it gives you control of the light and it's actually really easy. Um, it's very, very simple to understand. You just have to follow some basic principles. Uh, and in fact, as a complete bonus, um, in and above talking about the R5, right now you're going to get a flash workshop in about five minutes, maybe less. Uh, so this is going to be flash in a flash. That was a horrible, horrible, horrible uh, joke, Dave. I should never do that again. Um, I probably will. I'll forget and reuse it at some point. Uh, anyway, so flash. Why, uh, why flash? How flash? Cameras are essentially dumb. Even the R5, as intelligent and brilliant as it is, can't tell the difference between shadows and highlights. In fact, here, let me come over here. You don't need to keep looking at pictures. They can't tell the difference between shadows and highlights. So you need to give them a helping hand. Cameras want everything to be a mid-tone grey, and I'm sure you've experienced this, where you've pointed the camera at something white, uh, and it's ended up grey, underexposed, or you've pointed it at something dark or black, and it's ended up grey, overexposed. Uh, and when you use flash, people seem to be under this impression that when you use flash, suddenly everything is fixed, and the camera can now tell the difference between a shadow and a highlight. Uh, it can... Uh, work out the exposure, it can solve overexposure, it's like some kind of holy grail and then they take a couple of pictures and it doesn't do what they wanted it to do and they realise it's not the holy grail they thought it was. I mean it actually is, they just didn't understand how to make it work. So how do we work with flash? Well a really good quick simple way of working is set your camera to manual. Okay so you are going to, uh, if I can, uh, let's turn this one on, uh, and let's, here we go. So we're going to pick manual, okay? Uh, and the reason we're going to pick manual is because now we get complete control of our shutter speed and our aperture. Uh, so we can set it to whatever we need it to be to get the exposure that, that we, uh, we want it to, to be at. So the ambient light, we're going to set our exposure for the ambient light effectively. Let's, let's try and get some focus, shall we? Here we go. We're going to get focus on the buttons on my desk. Look at that. Uh, how how exciting. Uh, so we set our exposure. Uh, we can even bring up the live histogram if we want. Uh, and we can make sure that, let's say that nothing is overexposed. Okay, because that's the goal. We maybe don't want everything or anything to be overexposed. Certainly in the case of the, the pictures, uh, the portraits I was showing you, I did not want any overexposure on the, on the blouse, the white blouse that she was wearing. And hence I pulled the exposure down. That means that the shadows get darker. Background obviously is going to get darker too. Basically everywhere that's not lit quite so much or is not as bright. So now we need to put flash in. And the trick is to remember what I told you before. That being uh, that the camera can't tell the difference between shadows and highlights and flash does not change that. So what you have to do is tell the camera whether you are photographing something brighter or darker than a mid-tone. If you have a scene that is predominantly brighter than a mid-tone, so you've got a subject where, as was the case in the portraits, they, uh, the, the subject was wearing a white blouse and there was quite a lot of white in there, the camera is going to underexpose... Oh, come back here. Sorry, camera went to sleep there. The camera is going to underexpose the flash because the way the flash works is it fires a pre-flash. Now, I would try and demonstrate this, but you wouldn't see it in real life and you definitely won't see it over a camera. So the camera, when you take a picture with flash and the flash is in ETTL, will fire two pulses of light. The first one is a metering flash. So the camera measures the ambient light um, when you uh, half press the shutter button and stores it. When you fully press the shutter button, it does it again because you may have focused and recomposed. Actually, something with an R5, you are substantially less likely to do because if, you, if you've got the eye tracking turned on, your focus and recompose is, is much less frequently, must, much less likely to happen because the camera is going to pick up where the eye is and focus on it. You're not going to have to focus and then change your view slightly. Anyway, so the camera takes that, uh, that uh, ambient light reading, stores it, and then when you fully press the shutter button, it does it again, and then it fires the flash and takes a whole new light reading. At that point, it's got a, uh, an ambient only reading and a combined flash and ambient reading. 
and therefore if it subtracts one from the other, it knows what component of that came from flash. And it looks for big differences. So if we come back here, um, when the flash fires onto, onto my subject here, uh, let's just bring this up to quick check. So light hits the subject, light travels beyond the subject and hits the background, but because the subject is closer to the camera than the background, more light bounces back from her. And if more light bounces back from her, there's a greater difference between the ambient only reading and the combined flash and ambient reading. And therefore the camera can work out where the subject is. And if it knows how much light it put out and measured how much light came back, it can then work out how far away the subject is. And this is the key bit of information in determining how much light it needs to put out. Now white, or in this case a light blue, um, is likely to confuse it. But here we don't have a lot of light blue. We've got some neutral skin tones, uh, which are um, fairly close to a mid-tone. Uh, the bright area of that blouse uh, down the bottom uh, is a bit brighter than a mid-tone, but it's kind of offset by the darker areas in the hair. Uh, and that means that overall we've got a fairly mid-tone average. Now that's really important because the way the camera measures the light is it uses evaluative light metering. Um, whatever you've got set on your camera, flash is measured evaluatively. Uh, and that means it's going to hopefully, as it has done here, work out pretty well. Now, if the camera gets this information, it's, it's taken the pre-flash, it's measured how far away the subject is, it's stored that bit of information, it then communicates with the lens and says, hey lens, how far away are you focused? I think, based on firing light at it, that the subject is, I don't know, two meters away. And then the lens will confirm or deny that it's focused at about two meters. Uh, and if so, everything is good. If not, then you may run into problems because some third party lenses, not all by any stretch of the imagination, but occasionally you'll come across a lens where you will end up with either, you know, two stops over exposure or two stops under exposure consistently uh, or a stop or whatever it might be. And there's nothing you can seemingly do about it. That's, that's because the lens is reporting the wrong distance information. And in reporting the wrong distance information, uh, it's telling the camera that maybe it's focused further away or nearer than it is. Uh, and if it's consistently the, the same amount of wrong or it's just one fixed diff distance, then you are going to end up with inconsistent flash exposure. As I say, that's a very rare occurrence, but it's just one to be aware of. So. Where were we? We've taken an ambient reading, we've taken a combined flash and ambient reading, and we've worked out the dis difference. We know how far away the subject is. At that point, if, uh, well obviously on the R5 no mirror, the shutter can open, the flash will fire, the shutter will close again and the picture is done. That is the second, uh, that is the second flash, okay? Um, that you won't see because it looks like it happens all at once. Now, if you're metering from a subject, if I come off this picture and we go back to, uh, I don't know, um, let's try this one again. We'll come back here uh, and I am going to put this, oh no, no, we'll leave it as is. So we've got a lot of bright in there, a lot of white, uh, which is actually far greater than the amount of dark that's in there. And that means that the camera is going to want to underexpose it with flash. So we've set the camera manually but the flash is going to want to underexpose it. And in that case, all we do is we go into the camera and we say, or we go to the flash and we say, no, we're going to use flash exposure compensation. Okay, in this case, positive flash exposure compensation to give it a bit more light. Okay, now if you have a balanced uh, ambient light exposure, uh, that being your shutter speed after an ISO, then flash exposure compensation kind of becomes uh, a bit like a dimmer switch, a little bit brighter, a little bit darker. If flash is a major component of your picture, as it was, uh, as you could see uh, in here, where you know this is the first picture, this is the second, um, there's, there's some ambient light in here, but we're going to use quite a lot of flash to, to balance it up. Suddenly, flash exposure compensation becomes very much more important. So you have to be much more aware of it. And how do we set it? Well. Uh, let me uh, let me come to here. Um, there are a couple of ways of doing it. We can either do it on the flash itself, or we can do it in the camera menu. So here, if I scroll down to external speed light control, uh, we go to our, uh, flash firing. 
uh, and it gives me the opportunity to show you one of the cool features um, uh, of the R5 and that's this actually slightly new version or new bit of ETTL metering which is the evaluation face priority. Now because the camera can find where faces are it does actually make it a little bit more accurate. There's less time or less need for you to use flash exposure compensation. Now, I've just seen a question, David, uh, how much flash exposure compensation do you need to give it? Well, that depends on, oh, you can't see me, arguably for the best, uh, many would say. Uh, that depends on how much bright or dark you've got in the scene. Do you think that the subject overall or the scene overall works out to be a mid-tone or works out to be brighter or darker than a mid-tone? Um, so that, in this case, would depend how much of the white was in the scene, and the, the white of the blouse, uh, or, or how much dark hair there was. Or indeed, if she changed her top to a darker top, so if she'd put on a, a dark blue top or a black top, for example, uh, then I'd have had to go on the other way, and it would have been by a different amount. But if you know how to use exposure compensation, i.e. not with flash, uh, then it will be by about the same amount. As I said, though, if you're doing a balanced fill flash result, if you're looking for a balanced fill flash result, then it becomes a little bit more subjective. It's a bit more like a dimmer switch. Um, in, as I said, in a case like this where there's a bit more flash going in there, you do have to be that bit more accurate. But EOS R5, ETTL2 metering, evaluative face priority. So this is because if we can detect where a face is in the frame, the camera can balance its flash exposure metering to that area and hopefully, as indeed it does, ignore a little bit of the surrounding area, so in this case the white blouse. Now, in my testing, I don't think it's perfect. I think it is an improvement and does indeed mean that you don't need um, to use as much flash exposure compensation or as frequently as you would have done in the past, but it is not a set and forget. Oh, We've lost it. It's not a, it's not a set and forget. It's not a like turn it on and you never have to worry about it again. Uh, it's still something that you have to pay attention to. Apologies there for forgetting that or for not noticing that the screen decided to go black. Now I said that we always use evaluative flash metering or flash metering is always done evaluatively. Um, I marginally told a little white lie. By default it is, but we do have the ability to do an average metering. Very few people do this. And we do also have the ability to do a spot reading, but you can't set it. Uh, what you have to do to get a spot reading is to take a, um, a, a basically, a, 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 you fire the flash, the pre-flash. So we do uh, flash exposure metering independently of taking the picture. So you'd push your exposure lock button, your AE lock button, which is the star button on the back of the camera. That will fire a pre-flash. Uh, and that gives you a spot flash reading, so it will read from a defined area. Now, I've not done a direct comparison uh, between doing that and doing the face priority um, ETTL2 metering, so I can't give you a definitive which is better. The one advantage that taking a spot flash reading or a, a flash exposure lock reading has is that you fire the pre-flash at that point, and then there's a little bit of time before it then fires the main exposure because it's waiting for you to push the shutter button. If you've got someone that blinks a lot, that can be a benefit. But otherwise, my recommendation from what I've done so far is that this default setting evaluative face priority actually does work quite well, but still pay attention to your flash exposure compensation, um, just maybe not quite as much as you would have done in the past. So that is actually, it's a cool new thing that we've got in the R5 and R6 purely because of the focusing system helping us identify where, um, where, the, where the face is within the frame. Uh, okay, da, 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 da. any more questions? No more questions. A few more people join. John, Tim, Mary, Phil, uh, and Jean. Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, okay, so in terms of uh, setting flash power, if we wanted to, we can go into our flash uh, function settings. Now you'll see that I've put uh, an SDE3 on here, you saw that before. And we've got a variety of options. So there's ETTL, there's manual flash, that's different to uh, manual camera settings. We've got multi for strobe, and then we've got group. And if you have 
uh, one of the RT flash guns I highly, 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 can't emphasize it enough, rec uh, recommend group mode because it allows you to control up to five groups of flash guns and they can even be in different modes. So we can have this one in ETTL, for example, group A and group B can be in manual, group C could be in manual, group D could be in ETTL, uh, group E could be in manual again, and you can set all of the powers independently. So again, that's actually not a new R5 thing, uh, but it's just a little bit of the Canon flash system. Any questions on that? Uh, is that on the R6 II? David, yes, it is on the R6 II. Uh, so yeah, you will get the, uh, the uh, evaluative um, face priority flash setting on the R6 because as I said, it's part of the focusing system effectively. It's the way the camera is detecting focus and the focusing system between the R6 and the R5 are basically identical. Uh, there's no real difference in them at all. So yes, uh, you'll find that on the R6 as well. Uh, okay, so that's uh, that was flash in a flash. It was not quite as flashy. Damn it, I wasn't going to use that joke again, was I? Sorry. Um, it was not quite as flashy as uh, as I'd hoped it was going to be. Uh, I maybe waffled and rambled a little bit, but hopefully you understood what I was uh, trying to say about flash. So let's um, let's actually come out of. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to come out of here, and I'm going to try and find uh, a another picture of or some more pictures of Otis. Uh, uh, let's leave that there, um, or maybe Otis, or possibly even, here we go, now these, uh, this is not Otis, for those of you that are sick of seeing Otis, um, the good news is, how can you be sick of seeing Otis, he is super cute isn't he, um, the good news is that you don't need to see Otis, you can actually see another dog, uh, a different dog, this time uh, this is my parents dog, oh you should actually probably help if you could see it, here we go, uh, this is Charlie, now this is another portrait. This is uh, natural light. Uh, Charlie is an 11-year-old border collie. For those of you that are missing Otis, I promise I'll show you some more pictures of him in a while. Um, so, if you're doing uh, if you're doing um, portraits uh, of dogs, for example, the big challenge you've got is getting the eye. Now, here, this is a, a deliberately challenging situation for the camera. I've offset the eye in the corner of the frame. I have, uh, obviously the nose is quite close, it's not a long way away from uh, the eye, it's quite a long snout, he's a border collie, um, he's a very hairy, lovely beastie. But the classic mistake that an AF system could make is that you could end up in focus on the nose. Uh, and, oh, hello, back again, uh, on the nose here. But as you can see, if I punch this into 100%, uh, we, we wait a couple of seconds while my computer uh, gets all excited about it. Uh, there we go. Uh, he has appeared. Oh, there we go. Some more people. Philip, hello. Philip Bernal has joined. Welcome, Phil. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, Jeff and Stephanie. Goodness, you, we're, we're very busy tonight, but you're not all asking many questions. Uh, ask, ask questions, everybody. Uh, right. So, it makes my life so much easier if you ask questions. It gives me so many more things to talk about. Uh, and right at the moment, David is is David Portwain is is keeping your end up, guys. He's he's holding uh, holding the fort for you. So here we go, 100% view of uh, Charlie's eye, uh, and you can see that obviously the nose is out of focus. The camera has managed to catch the eye uh, with that uh, eye detection, uh, and there is the focus point. I'm hoping you can see that. It's incredibly faint. Uh, let me see if I can zoom the screen up. Uh, it, there we go. Look at that. You can just about see it uh, on the screen. Uh, so it's showing that the camera has picked up the eye despite the fact, if I come back out again, uh, despite the fact that it is, um, it's very much off-centred. It's out in the corner of the frame. Uh, it is, um, it's a, a particularly challenging situation for the autofocus and yet it's performed, uh, performed admirably. Okay, uh, let's come out and find another one. The reality is with autofocus I could pretty much keep going all night uh, telling you about how great it is and showing you examples of it um, to try and find you, you know, since we're talking portraits. Um, what was that one? Oh, here we go. Now, I won't lie, occasionally when photographing Charlie, uh, it did miss his eye. This one didn't, this one got it. And what you've got to be aware of here is it does need something to focus on. This one, actually, no, this this got it. Yep, that's sharp. You should all be able to see that that's sharp. 
Uh, there we go, nice and sharp on the eye there. Uh, but occasionally, it did miss. Now, I'm hoping you can all understand. I'm now, you see, I'm struggling to look at my own screen because, uh, uh, because I've got lights in my face and it's all quite dark. Um, or at least the screen is very dark. Now, in this situation, Charlie's got this really, really, really dark black face and he's slightly backlit, which means his face is all in shadow, his eyes all in shadow. And this is a proper challenge uh, for the camera. And as you can see, if I put the focus on, we were in eye detection, but it's not, in theory, hit it. Uh, it seems to think that it's got the nose. Um, da, 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 da. Um, uh, can we, right. The, wow, loads of you, you've all got involved on the questions. Right, let me show you this and I'll, I'll deal with all of those questions. Good job, guys, well done. Uh, right, so here you can see that it has actually, I mean, it's actually caught the eye itself. It's, it's back from where it says it is. It has caught the eye, but that's an incredibly challenging situation for uh, for the camera. It's still got it, even though the AF point is telling me it hasn't. So there we go. It's that good. It can lie to me and still get it right. But no, in all honesty, occasionally it, it has missed. Um, but it's situations like that where it, it, it's hard enough for me to see the eye in the picture. So asking the camera to be able to see the eye as well uh, is probably asking a bit much. Right, let's see. Uh, you wanted to see uh, my settings. First up, I'll deal with the, the, the settings questions first. There we go. So Dave, Dave Val said, can we see your settings for Charlie? You certainly can. Uh, here, let me get rid of the shadow highlight alerts because that's just distracting. Right, the settings are 500 the second, f5.6, ISO 200 and 400 mil. So this is shot on the uh, EF. 100 to 400 mil uh, f4.5 5.6 mark II lens um, and if i can find uh, if i can find the settings uh, we can see what it might tell us uh, let's try and get some expanded settings because the smaller settings aren't going to cut it uh, where are we it can be quite slow working with 45 megapixel files here we go general settings view settings no, general settings. I don't want that. Right, we're going to show you this in a different place. This is much easier. Let's go into quick check. Uh, and uh, where are we? Hit info. There we go. So we had face detection. Uh, so this actually, this answers almost three of the questions that came up in one. So David, is there a setting for animal eyes? Here we go. So we've got subject to detect animals. So there is a setting for animal eyes. You've got animals and humans, or you've got leave it as, and I'll show you where that setting is on the camera menu in a moment. Um, we can see which case study I was using uh, and that we had subject sh switching slow because there were no real subjects I wanted to switch to. Uh, and we've got face detection with tracking AF. Okay, so these were the settings. This also answers the second question. Chris Woodman, will EF uh, will using EF lenses have any detrimental effects on the autofocus? Um, no, actually. In fact, EF lenses seem to perform better on the R, the R5, and the R6 than they ever did on uh, on the uh, on, on a DSLR camera, and that's because there's extra communication between the camera and lens, and because the camera's focusing system, as in within the camera, is so much more advanced, it can detect. Uh, focus in a much lower light level than, than pretty much all of the DSLRs. And so it seems to focus faster than it ever did. So no, there is absolutely no detrimental effect um, of using an EF lens. Is it as fast as an RF lens? I can't honestly say I've done a back-to-back -back test, but hopefully if you, you've probably seen the sequences of images that I've posted of Otis running, um, uh, and they were shot with the EF 100-400. Uh, in fact, for those of you that maybe haven't, uh, just in case you haven't seen them, I actually exported another one today. Uh, this is, obviously we're slightly off base of portraits right now, uh, but let's, uh, let's take this one as an example, uh, and I will give you the 100% view of this. This is Otis running towards the camera flat out, uh, and uh, I think we can all agree that that's pretty 
damned razor sharp. And this is shot on an EF lens, uh, not an RF lens. This again is the EF 100 to 400mm, 4.5 to 5.6, the Mark II version. Um, so you can definitely, definitely, definitely use um, uh, 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 EF lenses and still get phenomenal results. In fact, this, this was a sequence that I'd shot a couple of weeks ago but hadn't really looked at. And I looked at it earlier on today and I was gobsmacked, blown away, particularly by that frame. But in fact, this sequence, the whole sequence, pretty much all of the images are sharp. Uh, there's one, I think this one here, it's, mar I mean, Otis, you want to see Otis. Uh, it's marginally back here and we've also got a bit of subject movement going on here around there's a little bit of blur uh, because of his motion at that point. Uh, and it's marginally back on his ear rather than his eye. Uh, but the image before you've just seen, and that was razor sharp, and the image after, uh, again, is razor sharp uh, once more. So it's, it's like one miss in a sequence of 27. Uh, okay, now, let me show you uh, the settings in the camera. Because, uh, David, I showed you the settings uh, on the... Um, uh, um, on the screen, that was it, that's the word I'm looking for, well done Dave. Uh, but we also have settings in the camera. So I kind of ran through this a little bit last time, uh, but to make sure for those of you that didn't see last time or, or maybe don't want to listen to me talking uh, or indeed have to look at my face uh, for more than you need to, I'm gonna quickly recap it now. So we have got uh, servo AF, obviously one shot for static subjects, servo for moving subjects. Uh, we've got our AF method, so face tracking, spot, single point, expansion one, expansion two, and then zones. But obviously we're interested in the face and tracking. Here we choose our subject to detect. Is it people or animals or no priority? And I recommend picking the one that you're going to be shooting. Okay, It just makes the camera's job a little bit easier. If it's having to guess whether it's looking for a, a person or an animal, uh, then it's got a little bit more processing to do and it, it may, I've got no evidence of this, but logically it says it may slow down the acquisition marginally. So I seemingly, and I've had good results doing it, picking the subject that you want to shoot. So be it an animal, dog, bird, cat, horse, whatever it might be, uh, or selecting uh, people. Um, I don't think the no priority one is going to be of much use to most people. Obviously, we've then got our eye detection disable or enable, so we're going to leave that turned on. Uh, and we can have continuous enable. Uh, this is not servo AF, so this is a common confusion point. Um, if you have servo AF set and continuous AF could be enabled or disabled, this is basically the camera continually hunting even when you're not focusing. Now, I personally prefer to have this disabled uh, because... I think it makes more sense that way. I don't want the camera to keep trying to focus when I might be pointing it at the sky or the, in the case of the picture I just showed you, you know, this one, the house in the background. I'd rather it wasn't continually focusing on that. Uh, so uh, I'd recommend turning your continuous AF to disable. Um, so that's where you find uh, those other settings. Uh, David, does the owner look like his dog? Um, he, he certainly does. Look at this incredibly handsome chap. I'll put myself up on screen as well. I've even got the big pointy ears. I look exactly like my dog Otis, or Otis looks exactly like me. Or perhaps you were suggesting that it was... No, where's it gone? This one. The one where he looks like he's run into an invisible glass wall. Arguably, that's more like it. And also, I mean, he's got he's got my tongue as well. I mean, it is like father, like son, right? The 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 what is it? The acorn never falls far from the tree. Thank you very much for that, David. Uh, I'll be sure to not answer any more of your questions in the future. I'm only joking. Uh, okay, so uh, let's get back here to the AF. Uh, so they're the settings that you really need to know about. Um, if you want to focus manually, um, I mean, I'm I'm not 100% sure why you would. Some people will want to focus manually, and there are, since we're talking focus, a couple of things that can help. Uh, one of them is focus guide. Uh, so let me see if I can show you that. If I put the camera, let's get rid of all of this jazz on here. I switch the camera to manual focus, and the focus guide appears. Now this, uh, this focus guide is, um, where are we? Here we go. 
Uh, let's put this to here. This focus guide has got little rabbit ears, kind of a bit like Otis's ears, if we're if we're entirely honest. Um, and what, uh, as I start to focus, come on, wakey wakey. Oh, uh, here, let me make a change. This is a good one to remember, guys. Um, do we want? Where's it got to? Exposure simulation enable uh, or disable? Uh, where are we? Have I missed a question? Uh, uh, interesting to test if people animal mode makes a difference with a bloke with a huge bushy beard. Do you know what? I happen to have a bloke with a huge bushy beard uh, just uh, just uh, like, I don't know, 20 feet behind me in like four rooms away. Uh, and uh, I, will, uh, I will have a test afterwards. I have photographed someone with a big bushy beard and it didn't seem to make a difference. It still picked up the eye. Uh, right, where are we? So, um, as I focus, it would probably help if I gave it something to actually focus on, like here. Let's be let's be cheeky. Here we go. We'll focus on another R5 just because we can. Uh, okay, so now you can see that the rabbit ears have come into focus, uh, and as the rabbit ears have come into focus, uh, it's gone green. That is the uh, that is the point of focus, right? So we can put that anywhere we want. This is our focus guide. Um, setting. Highly recommended if you want to use manual focus lenses. Um, it does make life a lot easier. Alternatively, um, if we come out of here and uh, we have a look in, uh, we're going to turn this off and we're going to go to the peaking settings and we're going to turn peaking on uh, and hopefully what we'll see now, here we go, is maybe It may not show it because we're, uh, yes, it may not show it externally because it, it thinks if you're firing it externally that uh, you have got um, an external monitor that will show it. So what I'm going to do, we're going to cheat the way I show you this, or we're going to modify the way I show you this, uh, and it's going to be a little bit of a juggle. Uh, what I want you to be able to see here, uh, I hope, so if I can find an angle that kind of works, that's not full of reflections, that kind of works. Now, brilliant, right. Can you see here on the screen, can you see this red moving across, uh, well, what is effectively the R, well, what is the R5 in the background? So this is focus peaking. This is used a lot in video, but also really useful for stills. And you, you can switch between the two uh, use um, use either peaking or use the focus guide, both of which will work. It's kind of a, a personal preference as to which one works for you. Essentially, what the uh, what the red in this case is showing you uh, is that's the area of maximum contrast. Now, to make your life a little easier, let me uh, let's plug this back in again, and lo and behold, our focus peaking will once more disappear. But uh, I have the ability to show you, sorry about that, uh, that we have some other colors, uh, not high, we've got some other colors. So you could have yellow or blue for your focus peaking. You can pick and choose which one works based on the colors of the subject that you're photographing. So that's a really useful little uh, technique, particularly if you're not using an RF or EF lens, if you're using a manual focus lens, um, and it, this could be for portraits or not, this could be for, for anything really. Um, if you're using a manual focus lens, you still get to make use of some of the focus system capabilities, both with that focus guide with the little rabbit ears, um, or indeed with this uh, this focus peaking, so that you can still ensure you get sharp shots. You don't have to just rely on what you see through the viewfinder. Uh, okay, uh, right, let's have a quick look in here. Uh, red, uh, let's come out of here and we'll see if there's anything else in here. I talked about the case study settings last time, so I'm not going to go over that again. Um, there's not an awful lot in here, but the last one is again something that I talked about last time, but I just want to reiterate because I think it's so important. When you're in uh, face and tracking, face detection and tracking, you have a couple of options as to where you let the camera start focusing from. So you can either set it automatically, in which case the camera will attempt to, um, uh, the camera will attempt to decide where it thinks your subject is and where it needs to start focusing. Or we can use the AF point uh, that was set in one of the other modes if we switch from them. 
or the one I most prefer uh, is this one, the initial AF point set for face. And that means we can use, if you remember, uh, let me show you this here. Uh, if we remember this here, our little uh, focus point selection button, or if you wanted to, you could push this and use the dials, but focus point selection, or indeed touch and drag AF. Uh, but that will allow us, um, let's bring this in, there we go, to pick the area that our focus point starts focusing from. Okay, um, so you can see that I'm moving this around. Although we're in face detection, I get to choose where it starts focusing from. So we're going to finish this off uh, like this. I put this here and I'm basically, as you can see, pointing the camera at the screen and despite the glare that's on the screen, although it's a very, very, very good, let me show you, very good ISO monitor. Uh, this is an ISO Color Edge CG319X. It's a, an anti-glare screen. But I've got a lot of lights going on in here and yet the camera is still detecting Otis's eye, not just his face. Uh, now you may say, oh, that's because you put the focus point up there, but it shouldn't be. Um, it does give it a helping hand. If I put it up here on his ear, let's have a look. We've picked his ear. If it picks up his eye, it might do. This is where I think this is so useful. You can give it a helping hand and make it a bit quicker. So if I put it here somewhere on his face, there we go, we're straight to the eye. You can see how much faster that is. So that's why I think this setting is one that everyone should be using and everyone should, uh, should, make, uh, uh, should you know, uh, make use of some of the features that you've got available in there. Right, look at that. Dear God, I've been going for over an hour and, and actually Matthew Webster, thank you. You've just literally summed up the whole thing. What a clever bit of kit that R5 is. Uh, it certainly is. Uh, incredibly capable bit of kit. Now, uh, hopefully I've answered all your questions. I don't think I missed anything as I went through. I will have a quick scan through the comments. If I missed anything uh, super urgent, I will uh, do my best to dive in there and answer them. But in the meantime, I'm going to say thank you so much for watching. Um, as a quick recap, we talked about the focusing system of the R5 and how it works for portraits. I also, bonus, because I'm nice like that, uh, gave you a quick flash tutorial in how ETTL flash works. Uh, so hopefully some of you found that useful. Uh, we looked at some pictures, uh, even uh, some, of, some of people, some of animals, even some where it's incredibly challenging. Remember the picture of Charlie where his eye was in shadow and backlit. Uh, and the camera still did reasonably well at picking up his eye. Uh, and then I showed you some AF settings as well uh, that are really going to help you with your, uh, with your photography of people or animals, portraits. So there we go. Thank you everybody uh, so much for joining in, uh, for asking questions, uh, for keeping this rolling along nicely. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I hope indeed that you're all still safe and well uh, and that hopefully you're managing to get out a little bit more, take a few more pictures. Uh, those of you that have pre-orders in for the R5, I will keep my fingers crossed for you that they turn up very soon because the sooner yours turn up, the sooner mine turns up as well. Uh, so, uh, so we can all cross our fingers uh, and hope that the supply chains can get moving again uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, in the meantime, please do get in touch. Uh, follow me on social media um, if you wish to. Uh, you can find me at Photopositive um, on Instagram or Photopositive on Facebook or Photopositive on the web. Um, pretty much Photopositive and my name will find me. Uh, obviously, if you've got any other questions, uh, you can get in touch with Camera World and they will do their best to answer you. Uh, if they can't answer you, they'll probably throw you to me uh, and then I will do my best to answer you as well. But actually, they're all pretty good in there. Uh, they've all got a pretty good understanding of the camera as well. So they should be able to help you. And obviously if you want to get your pre-orders in, uh, if you haven't got one in already, then I recommend you do. Otherwise that wait is only going to be even longer. In the meantime, thanks once again for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've learned something. Uh, stay safe, everybody. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, on another one of these at some point in the not too distant future. Any suggestions for what you might like us to cover, you hit up the comments, send us an email, send a message, Facebook, whatever, and let us know. Other than that, bye-bye for now, everybody. Thanks very much.